Hallelujah. Listen. Listen, it's time for the word of God. Hallelujah. I know our dancers was prepared to dance, but God has flipped the script. Hallelujah. They're not dancing today. I believe they, they had a wonderful rendition prepared. But I just feel that God is, is about to do something extraordinary in this house today. And somebody said to me, why are you bringing Pastor Dale back so quick? Let me tell you something. I, I'm going to tell you something. I enjoy preaching every Sunday. I mean, I've been preaching so that I just love it so, Sister Sale, that I can preach every Sunday. But the Lord laid it on my heart to bring it today. Amen. And that was just a prelude what God is about to do in this place. You in the right place at the right time. It's no accident, it's no mistake that you're in greater victory today. As a man of God, I decree and declare, you will not leave this place today. They say, I know that's a saying, thank you Holy Ghost. I know we say that, but Sister Sharissa, I really believe that. Today is your day. You are not leaving this place the same way you came in Jesus' name, stand to your feet. I'm not going to give a long introduction, but I want you to receive this great man of God that God has sent our way. I want him to be free and to minister as God allow him to go. Raise your hands and say, Pastor Dale, preach the word. Pastor Dale, be free. Pastor Dale, let the Lord use you to bless me with his word. I don't know what it is about greater victory, but uh, I mean, we didn't already had revival. And, uh, but I don't know what it is about greater victory, but every time I come to minister here, something starts happening to me. The last time for those of you who were in revival with us and Mr. Soundman, if I could get a bit more in the monitors. Um, for those who were with us last time, just stand with me for a moment. Uh, I was driving on the way to the revival meeting and a uh, car spinned out. But I didn't die. Then the next day, uh, then the next day, uh, in the hotel where I was staying in the spot that I parked every day uh, the Holy Ghost talked to me and he said I want you to go out to the coffee shop where I was able to minister to somebody the Lord led me to minister to somebody Sister Annette I came back to the parking spot I was in every day all day and a huge tree had come and crushed a couple cars but didn't get mine so, so when, when Pastor Britt asked me to come around this time, I said, oh, Lord. And I thought I was doing good till a few days ago. I found myself in the hospital with abscesses on my tonsils and throat. They had to go in and do some surgery. And uh, Tootie, who's here on the front, she's a part of our ministry team. She's been fussing at me all weekend because I probably should still be in the hospital bed resting up. And they said, you know, you should take it easy on your voice. And I said, well, if the enemy really wanted to do something, he would have made it so I couldn't talk at all. Well, since I got a voice, This must be the slow service. I said, well, since I've got a voice. The problem is some of you came and um, you got your hair done and your nails done and your eyes are on fleek and you got everything looking cute and uh, your limbs work. Um, 
you might not be working, but your body works. And so I just pose a hypothetical disposition before you. Since you're here, <laughs> since whatever you went through couldn't kill you, I'm going to give you another minute. I'm going to give you another minute. Since you're here. So Tootie, Tootie was fighting me and said, well, you got to call them and cancel them. And I said, I can't cancel this one. I actually like this church. I said, Mother Welch would be a little disappointed. Um, and I said, ain't no use of me having a little bit of voice and not being able to use it. Um, and I would shut up, but rocks don't have the testimony I have. I would be quiet, but rocks haven't gone through what I've gone through. So since my hands are kind of working and my voice hurts, but it, it's working, I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything else. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you. This is for you, sweetheart. That I believe you in spite of what the doctor says. Yeah. Now, everybody's not going to get on the same page, and we're going to sit in about 30 seconds. Because some of y'all look like I need a translator. And, and I get it, because when you don't have a worship life at home, atmospheres like this are uncomfortable and unusual, because they're unpredictable. But I wonder if, I, and I don't need everybody, and I know everybody won't get it, but I wonder if anybody can reach back to about two or three years in your memory and think about all the stuff that God brought you out of. The stuff, wait, 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 wait. The stuff that other folks went through and didn't make it out of. Come on, you and I know you should have lost your mind in the middle of divorce court, going through custody battles and doctor's report. But I wonder if you can just reach back long enough in your memory to slip up your hands, close your eyes, open up your mouth, and in your own words, just tell them thank you. <laughs> just tell them thank you. God, if we don't get to the end of the service, we want to tell you that we thank you. Come on, some of you are looking at me, but I wasn't there when he healed you. I wasn't there when he set you free. I wasn't there when he brought you out. I dare you to look to heaven and say, God, I thank you. I thank you for every time you touched me, every time you healed me, every time you brought me out, every time I felt like giving up and you didn't let me throw in the towel. I thank you. And I want to tell you that if you never do another thing, God, you still deserve all my praise. If you never touch me again, I want to tell you thank you. If you never bring me out, I want to tell you thank you. If you never pay another bill, I want to tell you thank you. Somebody lift up your voice and say, God, thank you. God, I thank you. God, God, I praise you. God, I give you glory. Hey! Hey! Lord, I love, I love you, you, Jesus, more than anything. Come on, one more time all over this room. I got a word to preach, but just say, I love you. I love you, Jesus. Said, I worship. I worship him. Just want to tell you Just want to tell you Lord, I love you Lord, I love you More than anything Now, God, we thank you because you are more than enough 
God, we want you bad this morning. God, we want you more than we want our next breath. So Holy Ghost, you inspire us, you transform us, you change us from the inside out. God, somebody in here needs you. They don't just want you, God, they need you. And so God, I'm praying you sweep on by these aisles. Go up and down these pews, pews. God, that you touch from the oldest to the youngest, from the guttermost to the uttermost, that you would save and set free, deliver this morning. And, and God, when it's all said and done, we won't promote ourselves, but we promise to give you all the glory. I mean, it already belongs to you, but we promise to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the prayer. God, we thank you for the spirit of revival in this house. I feel you, God. Evangelist Regina, um, I think it was your cousin we went to visit in the hospital, was it? What was her name? I need you to go ahead and text her and tell her, but before the year is over, God's about to upgrade her in every area of her life. I need you, I need you to tell her that her ministry is not wrapped up. Her life is not wrapped up. Her best days are not behind her. The devil, the devil is already defeated. Because I see the enemy coming to discourage her and tell her it's over and things are not going to be like they used to be. And they won't. They're going to be better. Ah. For, okay. Okay. I feel the spirit of prophecy in the room. I'm, I'm, and you tell her before the, before the year is up, God's not only going to touch her body, but tell her you should get ready for ministry again. All right, somebody give the Lord some praise. Come on, all over this room, put your hands together. Clap your hands. You may be seated. Thank you, Ben, and we'll be back in just a moment. I don't know about you, I'm glad to be in the house of God. I didn't get enough amen, so y'all frustrated me this morning. I don't know if you know this, but you could have woke up in the hospital this morning. You couldn't. You Thank God you were on the wake-up list. So I'm going to say it one more time. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. All right, this is what we got to do. I need you to do a row check. I need you to do a row check because sometimes it's somebody in your row who will mess up your whole flow. And I feel revival already in this house, and you got to make sure... Uh, that you didn't sit next to that ignoramus who said, I don't want to talk to my neighbor. I'm, I'm leaving early. I got a hair appointment. Um, you you got to make sure you didn't sit next to the wrong person because you got to sit next to somebody with faith this morning. You got to sit next to somebody who believes that your best days are ahead of you. That trouble won't last. If they're not, if they're not responding right now, that's how you know you're sitting in the wrong seat. You sit next to somebody who, who wants to be cute and didn't come to praise God. Pastor was up here singing and bleeding his heart out. And they're sitting there on their Instagram looking stuck on stupid. You got permission. Hashtag move your seat. You got permission to find you a different. Because I came for a move of God. I came to. Okay. All right. All right. I came. I came to see God move. Don't, don't let the collar fool you. I came to see a move of God. Okay, less if I preach this morning, I want to see God do something. One more time, just to make the religious folks nervous, give God your best praise. Well, I'm so excited to be in this house, uh, such a strategic house for the kingdom giving honor to the Lord who is the head of my life, to Pastor Britt and his first lady who I don't see at the moment, uh, but in her absence, we honor her to uh, Minister Uba, Reverend Lockhart and, and the associate pastors and uh, all the evangelists, the ones I know, the ones I don't know, and the ones I don't want to know, to Mother Welch with her beautiful self. 
Some of y'all can't clap because you're not as cute as she is and you're half her age. But we celebrate the history and the legacy in this house to evangelist Regina with her powerful self, one of the most anointed ministers on this side of heaven. Mr. Soundman, I'm going to need a lot in my monitor because uh, I'm keeping my voice low for a moment. Um, but I feel God in this house, and this would be a dangerous service to leave early. Uh, I, I feel I've been praying, and uh, something happened to me when I was here the last time that shifted things in our ministry. Uh, I mean, the prophetic and healing and divine knowledge is... Uh, been going through the roof. We were in one of our meetings, our conferences that actually some of your young people came to. And when we were in the conference, we started calling folks out, giving them their first and last names and bringing breakthrough in the house. Let, let me tell you this. Um, there, there's, 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 there's something about the prophetic that confirms that God still knows me, uh, that you are not hidden in the shadows of life. Uh, maybe you can't hear me, uh, but he still knows me. Would you just touch your neighbor and just say, he still knows me. So I, I, I feel something, and if it's all right with you, I'm going to just take my time and kind of move with the Holy Ghost. But the last time I was here, uh, not only did the prophetic, but we've been seeing financial ridiculous breakthrough. I mean stupid breakthrough. Uh, I've heard testimonies from the revival of when we were last here, people getting inheritances out, out the Richter scales and houses and all this other stuff and, and just ridiculous stuff. We uh, were in a service in our conference and uh, the Lord told me to tell the people, now if you know me, I don't do this unless the Lord really tells me. And I felt a breakthrough for $100 seeds. And so uh, one of the young ladies came down and gave a $100 seed, her and her husband, and they didn't really have it to give. Uh, and when I say really didn't have it, I mean really didn't have it to give. Um, and so they came and sold it, and I didn't know it. Well, she got a hold of me a couple days later. She said, Pastor, uh, I had applied for this job uh, back in December. I used to work for them, and, and here it is March, and they hadn't returned any of my phone calls, and I just figured I didn't get the job. Well, she said, when I sold $100, I sold it believing that God was going to bring a breakthrough in my occupation. She said, well, just the next day, I got a phone call, or two days later, that Monday, she said, I got a phone call from the job. Not only did they offer me the job that I had back, but they offered me $30,000 more a year, wait, 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 with benefits and three months of paid vacation time. They don't know when they're supposed to praise God. They missed it. And, and I say this because there's something strange in my life in this season. There's something strange. The Lord's told me in the beginning of the year that this would be a season of breakthrough. And we are seeing God week by week bring supernatural breakthrough. And, and I, I want to say this because I'm looking at some of your faces and, and you don't have the face of faith. And I can tell some of you came and, and this is a regular Sunday for you. Uh, but I want to talk to the faith folks in the room. I want to talk to the folks that you got some stuff that only God can do. Wave at me if I'm talking to you. All right, all right. Well, just do me a favor. Look at your neighbor. Say, don't text me this morning. Look at your other neighbor. Say, don't pass me a note. This is my year for breakthrough. Give God one more praise. All right, see, let me, can I just obey God, Mother Welch? I'm looking at um, my usher lady over here, right here. The Lord's speaking to me about you. Somebody let her know I'm talking to her. There's one usher over there. Somebody let her know I'm talking to her. C come on, sweetheart. Come on over here. I'm a little different. Is that all right? Can I be myself? Just come on. I remember I prayed for you last time. I think I prayed something about housing or a situation, was it? God didn't fix it yet. I like what you said, yet. That's an important word. Yeah. You got an inheritance. Okay. Can I tell you, uh, this is about to be an incredible season for you. I mean, because you've just gone through so many tears. 
I mean heartache after heartache. I don't know your story. Um, and I don't know if people know this about you because I don't really know you beyond me seeing you the last time. <clears throat> but you do have a heart to help the, the helpless. And uh, I see you taking in kids and children and all this other stuff. Am I talking right? Okay. Um, did we talk before service? Have we ever gone out? Because I, I feel the skeptical spirit in here, but you sit there and walk out just as cursed as you walked in. Um, but I, saw, I was over there and I saw Brother Antoine starting to talk to you and I said, oh Lord, distract me with something over there. And I just felt like God said, your season of tears are over. And wait. <laughs> okay. Okay, God. Okay. Can I just prophesy like I do back home? And, uh, and, uh, and God says, I'm about to bless you for your birthday. Wait a minute. Okay. Before your birthday comes, the Lord's not only going to bless, bless you with housing, housing but, but he's, he's going to bless you June 19th. Your birthday is June 19th. See, they're shouting, but I'm getting ready to cry. Because you survived desert seasons. You've survived season after season. And you don't complain. You just go make it. You go keep serving. You're not taking a break. You're not taking a sabbatical. You still go support. And you helped other folks when you needed God to help you. And you took your last. You know what I see? I see you like the Bible... I see, I see, I see, some of you are in here and you need to just go ahead and change your plans for after service. God's about to do something strange in this room this morning. Um, and what I see is that you've been like the woman who she only had enough for her and her child. And they were going to eat it and die. But then the prophet came. You got to watch out for prophets. See, people think, Sister Annette, that when the prophet comes, all he wants is your money. Whether you give your $2 or not, our ministry is not going under. Uh, my, my, my People don't uphold my ministry. Your check does not support my ministry. Um, God supports my ministry. Hey, listen, if you don't give, I'll go fishing and find a pearl in the, the fish's mouth. And he'll take care of me. Uh, that's old school. But if you live right... I'm going to try this side. Um, if you live right, he will take care of you. So what date did I say? June 19th. That's your birthday. Okay. Before June 19th comes, you're about to see stuff turn left and right. Not just inheritances. Because what that was was a blessing from the seed that you sowed during revival. There was a harvest that came. I'm telling you what I'm hearing from the Spirit because you gave out of your lack. But you're not going to be the woman who just eats what she has with her child and dies. But I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, I'm going to make more than enough because you've got to have multiple homes for all the children that you're going to foster. Do you have any foster kids now? Or any children you're taking care of now? How many do you have you're taking care of now? One, any of them foster children? She's a foster child. Okay, did we talk about you having foster children? Uh, you're going to have more than one. I mean, God's going to bring in more. Uh, you you, you got to be careful what you ask for. Don't ask for a blessing if you don't want to be one. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You, God will get the blessing to you if he can get the blessing through you. Some of y'all stingy saints ain't with me, but it's all right. Um, lift your hands lift your hands yeah God I thank you that everything's turning around before June 19th God I thank you that this is not a season of sad tears this has now become a season of joy God she never lost her dance but there were some seasons she lost her joy nobody knew but she did lose her joy but God I thank you that you're giving her her joy back and because she survived the test of lack, 
she's going to survive the test of overflow. In Jesus' name. Somebody give the Lord some praise. Y'all praise God real weak in Seaside. I said, give God some praise. I'm telling you, if you'll praise him, he'll do it in your corner. Somebody say, Lord, over here, over here, over here, over here, right here. You, if you want to bless anybody, come on and bless me. If you want to touch anybody, you can come on and touch me, God. Let me, let me, let me preach so, so we can make you happy. No, I, it, I don't know what it is about this church. Y'all messing me up. I think the last time I came, I was getting people's names and husbands' names and all kinds of stuff. And, and folks walking up to me, I told one lady that God was going to cancel debt. And she came up to me and told me about a debt she had of about $8,000 that had been canceled the very next day with no reason. At least the bank didn't have a reason. <laughs> All right, let me, I, okay, turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, and you don't have to stand because I read quite a bit and skip around. John chapter 11. I, I feel real good in my soul. I like preaching behind Pastor Britt. He makes it easy. He does the hard work and tills up that fallow ground. What would happen if you came to church and didn't have to get ready, but you came already ready? What if we didn't have to do 15 backflips, a revelation and a prophetic dream to get you to lift your hands? Were they not singing the songs I like? You go hate heaven. John chapter 11, if you've got it, say amen. If you need more time, say, hold up. All right, I got you. John chapter 11, that's right after John chapter 10. Band, y'all looking good over there. Y'all staying safe? Y'all didn't, okay, that didn't look too sure. We'll work on that, we'll work on that. They said, we saved today. <laughs> John chapter 11, verse 1 through 6. If you've got to say amen. Are y'all all right this morning? Okay. If you leave early, I won't be offended. You'll just miss it. John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and uh, the brother of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he who you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Somebody say, God's going to get some glory out of this. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Jump down to verse 17. Verse 17. Verse 17. Where's my usher? Where's my usher again? Is she still over there? Stand back up, wave at me, just stand right there. Um, if, 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 um, if, right. you must be single. Are you single? Why is she not talking to me? <laughs> is it complicated? Yeah. Somebody who knows her, is she single? Yeah. Now, if, don't worry, I'm not trying to flirt. But I, I'm going to tell you what I heard God say. If you want it, he'll bless you with a good man. Okay. Y'all shouted and didn't even hear the two important things. Number one, if you want it. Number two, a good man. Because he's going to send you a man that makes up for all the faults. Of all, okay, go ahead and sit down. The service isn't about you this morning. 
telling you, birthday blessings are coming. All right, John chapter 11, verse 17. Any single people want to get married, just say, over here, Lord. Okay, that was real. Okay. I felt a judgmental spirit. <laughs> verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Then Mary said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, verse 22. But even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha got real spiritual in verse 24 and said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, one more verse. Just so is it all right if we read one more verse? John chapter 12, verse 9. John chapter 12, verse 9. I feel, I feel preaching power this morning. Verse 9, it says this, Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, speaking of Jesus. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. I, I don't want to hold you long, but I probably will. But I want to encourage you with this, and I need you to help me to encourage your neighbor. The title of my message is very simple. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm coming out. Look at your second choice, your other neighbor, and say, neighbor, did you hear what I said? I'm coming out. <laughs> Somebody say, preach, black man. <clears throat> As we approach this uh, famous text, we come understanding the context in which we uh, find Jesus. Jesus has just escaped the wrath of the, the Jews around him who wanted to stone him for blasphemy. Jesus is walking around claiming that he is Lord, that he is God. Jesus has gone to be with his cousin, John, where John is baptizing and many are coming to believe in Christ. In the height of all that's going on, Jesus now has to deal with the news that his friend, Lazarus, is sick. Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick and in need of healing. Now understand something. This is no ordinary man. This is Lazarus. This is Lazarus, Jesus' friend. This is Lazarus, the brother of Mary. This is Lazarus, uh, the brother of Mary, who washed the feet of Jesus with oil and wiped it with her hair. This is Lazarus, the brother of Martha who took care of Jesus while he was in town. This is Lazarus, the Bible says, the one whom Jesus loved. Hmm. Lazarus has not died, but he is sick. Hmm. And, and to make matters worse, the Bible says here in verse 5 and 6 of chapter 11, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Jesus is told that his friend needs him. And instead of moving towards the needs of his friend, Jesus stays where he is and ignores his friend's request. And can I ask you a question at the beginning of this message? Have you ever had Jesus love you enough to ignore you? 
Listen, I, I know what the scripture says. I know Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not short that he cannot reach in his ear, not heavy that he cannot hear. I know John 14, 14 says, You may ask me for anything and I'll give it to you. I know Matthew 7 verse 7 says, Ask and it shall be given to you. I know James 5, 16 says, The prayers of a righteous man availeth much. But have you ever had God ignore your request? But if we called the brother Lazarus uh, and, and sister Martha to the stand, they would testify that he loved me enough to ignore me. And we don't have to call them to the stand, really. Why don't we put your prayer life on the, the stand of this judicial theological disposition? Uh, truth is that I praise God for every answered prayer. I praise God for the time I laid hands on a young man who had a tumor under his arm and God healed him. I praise God for the young lady who came to me with cuts on her arm and we prayed for her and supernaturally the cuts disappeared. I thank God for all the prayers that he answered, but I praise him even more for the ones he didn't. I want to thank God for all the stupid stuff I prayed for that he didn't answer. Now, and all y'all ain't going to say amen because some of your stupid stuff you got married to. But the truth is, there was some stuff that God ignored. And we ought to, I want to thank God for every time he shut a door in my face. I want to thank God for every relationship he didn't let me get into. I want to thank God for all the jobs he didn't let me have. I want to thank him for all the opportunities he didn't let me divulge in. I want to thank him for all the friendships I thought I couldn't live without. And he told me bye-bye. I want to thank him. Not just for the things he did, but the things he didn't let happen. I need you to take about 10 seconds, put your hands together and say, thank you for ignoring me. Now, now why would God ignore me, his friend? And not only has he ignored Mary and Martha, but let's talk about the fact that Jesus loves Lazarus and he still ignores him. Have you ever had Jesus ignore a request gone bad that he was invested in? I mean, you didn't ask for the job. You came and sowed your seed, and the prophet said a promotion was coming. All of a sudden, you get the promotion, and you bucking and shouting and shouting and bucking, and thank God. And six months later, the company is closing, and the thing that God gave you is dead. I ain't going to get no help this morning. But have you ever had something that God gives you? Get sick. Mm. Now, after Jesus has taken his sweet little time, somewhere around verse 17, he decides to finally head up to the funeral, and Martha meets him there. Martha begins to have a dialogue with Jesus in verse 21. In verse 21, the Bible says, Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he's going to rise again in the resurrection at the last day. In verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Now watch this. I've got two problems with sister Martha. My problems with Martha, it's not about her theology because her theology is solid. She knows that Jesus is able to do anything. But here's my problem. Number one, Martha has someday syndrome. Yeah, 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 God, I believe he's going to rise up someday. I, I believe that when the last day comes, then he's going to do it. And the problem with the saints is that we've got someday faith. But the Bible says now faith. Y'all not going to talk to me. The Bible says now faith. You need today faith. You need the kind of faith that says today is my day. I don't care what it looks like, but I will live and not die. I don't care what the doctor says, but today is my day. And if it don't happen today when I wake up tomorrow, today is going to be my day then. You've got to stop saying someday I'm going to have the business. Someday I'm going to get a good husband. Someday I'm going to marry a good wife. Someday I'm going to graduate. At what point did he become the God of today? I'm preaching better than you're responding, but it's all right. 
My second problem with Sister Martha is that Martha's faith is in the resurrection. But it's not in the resurrector. This might be too heavy for a Sunday morning. I should have came for a Bible study. Um, the, the problem is that she has faith for the resurrection, but not for the resurrector. We often confuse because we don't know Greek or Hebrew, but I was talking to one of my friends who has two PhDs in both Hebrew and Greek, and I was asking him about this thing about Jehovah Jireh. I said, God is Jehovah Jireh. He's my provider. And he said to me, he said, that is not correct. I said, I know it's correct because they taught me that at convocation. They preached that he's Jehovah Jireh. He's my provider. He said, that's not the fullness of it. I said, well, help me understand. He said, when you call him Jehovah Jireh, what you're saying is not that he is the God who provides. He is the God who is provision. Okay, only the smart people go stick with me this morning. Uh, 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 well, what's the difference? See, I can get the provision and still miss out on the provider. But if I get the provider, I get the provision. Okay, let me break it down. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus is on the boat. And, uh, and I'm only on the third, second page of my notes, but we're going to make it through. The Bible says that Jesus is on the boat with the disciples and a, uh, a storm breaks out. And when the storm breaks out, they wake Jesus up from his sleep. And when they wake him up, he does what he does and he speaks peace. He speaks shalom, which means nothing missing and nothing broken. And then he goes right back and he looks at them and says, how long will I be with you perverse generation? The disciples look at them, look at Jesus and ask a question. These are the disciples of Evangelists who have walked with him, who have seen him. They will heal the woman with the issue of blood. They were there when Jairus' daughter got healed. They were there when the centurion slave got healed. They were there and they saw the man come down from the roof and get his healing. They were there when the man who was lame for 38 years. And isn't it funny how they had walked with Jesus and their question was, what kind of man is this? Because even the disciples could walk with Jesus and still not know who he is. Because <laughs> they had caught the healing, but they did not catch the healer. And the dangerous part in the body of Christ is that we're sowing seeds for stuff he never told us to sow seeds for. Y'all not going to talk to me. Okay. Because uh, you're sowing seeds for your breakthrough instead of the breaker. You're sowing seeds for your healing instead of the healer. You're sowing your seed for provision instead of the provider. I've got good news for you. That if you get the provider, then you get the provision. If you get the healer, then you get the healing. I dare somebody to reach up to heaven and say, God, be everything to me that you want to be. Whatever you want to be. I say, come on by here, God. Just do what you want to do. Have your way. Just, 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 just show me. Well, you are. The Pharisees and Sadducees, Mother Welch, had spent their whole lives studying the Messiah. And when the Messiah came, they could not recognize him because they were offended by how he was doing stuff instead of realizing who he was. See, religious people ain't going to like me this morning because you're more worried about how Sister Boudreaux got a skirt that's too short and how Sister Watermelon has been clubbing out last night instead of the fact that the God of miracles is in the room. And whether she got a short skirt on or not, God can still look at the faces, look at the faces. Y'all not liking me this morning. Because as soon as I sit up here and I start talking about prostitutes, you go shut me down. When I start talking about whoremongers, you go sow a seed. But when I talk about your gossiping bad attitude and how you don't believe, look at how quiet it is. I had about 58 mans about three seconds ago. I'm down to about three bobbleheads, but it's all right. I'm going to make it. See, we've got to get to the place where we stop caring about folks and what they're going through. And we start realizing that God is able to change from the guttermost to the uttermost. I'm going to just ask, do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him? See, we don't even say stuff like this. They used to say, do you know him for the pardoning of your sins? We, we don't ask, do you know him? Because all we want is for God to be our $2 prostitute. If I give him a little money, then he can bless me. It's because you don't know him. Because listen, if you know him, the stuff you pray about would change. Some of y'all keep praying for money. When God pours out favor. And do you realize that it's all about who you know? 
uh, can you just push your neighbor, wake him up and say, do you know him? Because yeah, yeah, if you know him, you get his favor. Yeah, yeah. There's some stuff money can't get you. I don't care how much money you got. If I don't want to sell it to you, I'm not going to sell it to you. But if I know you, Okay, let me take it a little bit farther. Everybody's sitting around here talking about they know God. You got this rapper on the Grammys who's singing worship songs and then going back home to his girlfriend sleeping around having babies out of wedlock and everybody's celebrating the fact that he's saved. But I want to know, not does he know God, but does God know him? I lost the young people because y'all was celebrating. That was your hero. And he's sitting around here whoremongering and sleeping around. And you're talking about the question when we get to heaven is not whether we knew God. He's going to say, I never knew you. This is old school preaching. This is why you don't recognize it. The question is, do you know him? But does he know you? Does he know you? <sighs> Y'all making me work. So, so, so Martha, your frustration is foundationally incompatible with your faith because you are believing for the resurrection instead of the resurrector. So Jesus has to say to her, I know you're believing for the resurrection. But the resurrection is not an event that you can assign yourself to on Facebook. The resurrection is a person and he's standing in front of you. Oh. And if you know me well enough, you can get stuff out of me that other folks couldn't get. Okay. Man, y'all need more Bible. Uh, Jesus' first miracle, he's sitting around minding his own business. Everybody's getting drunk and having a good time. And Jesus is hanging out with sinners at the, at the wedding at Cana. And all of a sudden, they run out of wine. And anybody from the hood knows that when the alcohol runs out, so does the party. And so Mary comes over to Jesus. Okay, you go act like you've been a deacon your whole life. Come on. You know what a red cup is. You know, okay, you don't know what the brown drink is. All right, all right, I'm going to talk to this side. Uh, some of y'all act like you came out of the womb speaking in tongues with your old sediddy self. You know you... Okay. I'm sorry. I almost got petty. I'm back. Watch this. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is, is at the wedding. And, and, and uh, 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 it's not yet his season to come forth. But his mother comes to him. And says, baby, they out of alcohol. Uh, can you go ahead and, and do the thing I saw you do back at home? You remember what you did for Daddy and that? I, I think he did it before. That's the only reason she knew he could do it. But then, some of y'all don't like this, but catch it on Netflix when you get to heaven. Um, go ahead and, and, and do the whole wine, the, the wine thing. And, and Jesus turns the water into wine. But there is a dialogue between him and his mother, which I don't understand because I was never allowed to have dialogue between me and my mother. But I guess if you're the savior of the world, you get a few freebies every now and then. And, and he, he says to her, woman, which... <laughs> they told me this is you Sunday. Try it if you want to. Um, woman and 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 he he says it's not my season it's not my time and and i like her response because she looks at the people around him and says whatever he tells you to do like nike says just do it and the crazy thing is that jesus does not fight her even though it's not yet his time because if you know him All right, all right, y'all making it hard. I'm going to give you one more. Maybe you'll shout on this one. Let me take it Old Testament, because uh, the Bible says that there were these three Hebrews, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, and they're standing there, and they're standing up for their faith in spite of the consequences. And the Bible says that the consequence was that they were to be thrown in the fire. So they turned up the fire seven times. And when they turned up the fire seven times, the people that were trying to throw them in got sucked into the fire and burned them up. Now, that's a sign to me. They didn't burn, but we did. I'm out. Sometimes you don't need the gift of prophecy. You just need the 10th gift of the spirit, common sense. I'm out. But they throw him in anyway. But this strange thing happens. They don't burn. Not only don't they, I'm a shout. Not only don't they burn, 
But somebody who has never been to seminary looks inside the fire and says, I don't see three men that we threw in. I see four. And there's something strange about the fourth one. That he looks like the son of man. Now it's not Jesus' time to come down to the earth and he's not supposed to yet live his 30 years and then three more and then die after his ministry is completed. He shows up in Daniel's book with the three Hebrew boys before his time. Why? Because if you know him well enough. If you know him well enough, you can get him to do stuff that he won't do for other folks. If you know him well enough, you'll get promotions and you ain't even been at the job for three months. If you know him well enough, he'll do stuff for you that took other folks 30 years. I dare somebody to shout and say, my time. Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him? I'm not talking about Sunday morning. I'm talking about late in the midnight hour when your body is wrecked up with pain. Do you know him? I'm not saying on Sunday night during the evening service, but I'm talking about on Tuesday when you're sitting up in your cubicle and got to rush to the bathroom because the Holy Ghost starts getting on you. Do you know him? I'm talking about when you're walking through Safeway and all of a sudden you got to kind of rub yourself because the whole, do you know him? Since I can't reach your neighbor, would you mind reaching over to your neighbor, bothering him one more time and say, do you know it? I'm almost on my last page. Do you know him? Because if you know him well enough, you can get him to do stuff that finances can't get you. Because favor will take you places that your money cannot afford. I'm going to say it one more time because you didn't tweet it. I said, favor will take you places that your finances cannot afford. You, you know you're not educated enough for the promotion God wants to give you. You, you. you know you ain't been saved enough to get the title of evangelist that God's trying to give you. You know you slept around. You know how many folks you slept around and God's sitting up here talking about, I'm going to give you a holy woman of God, a holy man of God. Why? Because if you know him well enough, you'll get stuff that other folks will look and say, I know her business. I know who she. Okay, okay. Let me, let me hurry up because we got to get to the buffet before the Baptist. Now, now if God, now if God is going to resurrect Lazarus, are you still with me? Because now by this time, he's no longer sick. He's dead. And if God is going to resurrect, am I helping anybody this morning? Now, if God is going to resurrect Lazarus, we've got to deal with two needs. The first one is that Jesus needs us to acknowledge where we've laid Lazarus. Hmm. He, he, he responds to them by saying, um, not how long has he been dead, not what was his condition, not what did the doctor say. After she has finished complaining and giving her theological disposition, Jesus looks at her and asks her a very practical question. Where did you lay him? Now, now, now uh, for my theologians, you understand that God is omniscient. That word there means that he has never been surprised, that he knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. He is Alpha and Omega. He's beginning and the end. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He knows the end from the beginning. He, he has no uh, beginning. He has no end. He's, he's never been taken off guard. There's never been a question that he can embody. He's always been the answer and the question. So it confuses me here as to why Jesus has to ask, where did you lay him? I mean, you know how many hairs are on Lazarus' head. And the Bible says that you've kept every tear in a vase. And you telling me that you've lost Lazarus? Uh, are you bad at playing the proverbial game of hide and go seek like you were with Adam and Eve in the Old Testament Garden of Eden? Or is it that you are asking Martha a question because maybe she's forgotten the answer? Martha, I, I, I know you're mad. And I know I came and I'm four days late. I saw you talking about me in the kitchen. Go sit up here and come to my brother's funeral. 
asked for an extra plate of macaroni and cheese and sitting up here my brother was dying and I you know I heard he when he heard he got my text message and didn't even respond he sat up there and sat there for two three more days and he could have healed my brother and I'm sitting up here and he come up here and ask for some food I wish he would ask for some food if you want to you go down okay uh-huh Jesus I believed that you could have healed him but I don't believe you could have resurrected him. Now, one day he'll be resurrected because we all got to be resurrected. Um, but you could have healed him and you didn't. And Jesus has to now deal with her microaggressions and say, Martha, I know you don't like me very much right now. And I know you told everybody that I'm four days late. But where did you lay him? And, and before you harass Martha too much with your uh, posture of piety, uh, where did you lay your Lazarus? Uh, I knew it was going to get real quiet right here. Uh -huh. uh, before you beat La Martha up too bad and before you tell Martha not to moan and Mary not to worry, I want to ask you, where did you leave Lazarus? And I, I, yeah, 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 for, 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 for uh, uh, Mary and Martha, it was about two miles away from Judea. But for you, it was probably in 1993, back when he broke your heart for the last time. <laughs> we gonna walk heavy today. Where, where have you laid Lazarus? Was it back in 2013 when they said you'd never preach again? Or was it back in 79 when he touched you inappropriately? Where did you lay Lazarus? <clears throat> Where's the place that you stopped believing that God could do? Was it that time you started the business and all of a sudden you lost the funding? Where did you lay Lazarus? Was it at the last two churches you got hurt at? Where did you lose Lazarus? I, I, I know, I know you're angry, but the truth is not that you're really angry. It's just that Lazarus has died. So if I'm going to do anything, I need to have an honest conversation with you. Because I need you to tell me, Sister Lockhart, where did you lay Lazarus? By this time, Lazarus has been dead for four days. And they've wrapped him up. Put anointing oil on him. Because just like my grandmother would do back in the day when I would go to her house, she don't really let me come over too much anymore. And she don't cook that good anymore. Because she's diabetic and she doesn't believe in sugar or salt. And you can't make sweet potato pie. Diabetic. Okay. I'm back. Some of y'all just said, thank you, Jesus. But I would go to her house uh, when I was in ministry school and I come over and you know grandma always cooks a little more than you need. It's just you coming over and it looks like we're about to feed the whole church. And uh, you come and she's got the macaroni and cheese and the collard greens and none of that turkey stuff. With, I'm talking about with the ham hocks, the smoked ham hocks. Some of y'all done got sadiddy and you doing turkey and you don't do pork. I'm not nation of Islam. God told Peter to eat the pig. I'm going to eat the pig. And, and smoked, and, and you're eating turkey gravy and, and cornbread. I'm talking about the, 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 the hot water cornbread and, and the candy yams. I'm, and you weren't light on the sugar. I'm talking about the kind of yams you had to bring out every 30 minutes just to stir around and give it extra attention and care. And, and you got the kind of mac and cheese that's creamy and cheesy. And, and you got the Kool-Aid that's just got the right amount of diabetes in it. And, and you're going around, and everything... And, 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 you know, just when you thought you were finished, you got the pot liquor that you got to sop up with the cornbread. Okay, some of y'all are getting set free right now. And, and you eat and you eat and you eat. You eat until your heart is more than happy. Till your stomach is pressed down, shaking together and running over. And you cannot eat anymore. And the problem that you made was that you got a third plate. And you've only made it about a fourth way through. And it's sitting there and you don't know what to do. And you know in grandma's house you don't throw nothing away. 
Because you and I both know that when Thanksgiving and Christmas is over, Reynolds wraps make their best money off of black folks. Because every refrigerator is shining with foil. And so the plate is sitting there, and what do I do, Grandma? Because she comes over and says, do I want some more? I said, you have fed me all that I can take. Fed me till I want no more. And she would go back into the kitchen, open up the second drawer, push the pot holders to the side, and there was this ribbon. And in this ribbon, she would cut a piece of this metallic paper and give it to me. And she would say to me, Mother Welch, wrap it up. Because that's what you do when you're done. Oh, you thought I forgot where I was. Uh, Lazarus is finished. And so we wrapped him up. <laughs> that, that's what you do to your marriage. You just wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. You used to have dreams of preaching on platforms and, and now you've gone through all kinds of hell and you said it's not worth it. And so you've gotten out the divine foil and you wrapped it up. <laughs> if a good man came and tried to take you out on a date, you've got more attitude than you've got edges and you can't find a good date. It's not because you're angry. You've just wrapped it up. You don't want to hear the prophet tell another prophetic word because you've been getting prophetic words about that business for the last 15 years. And all of a sudden, you find that you can't even spell capital. A bank won't give you a loan if you try. And you've wrapped it up. What do you, what do, you do when your dream has fallen more times than you can reconstruct it? You wrap it up. What do you do with that son and daughter where you've let them come back home even though they're strung out on drugs but now it's the 20th time and they're starting to steal from you and you want to believe God but your faith has run low. You wrap it up. What do you do with that young lady that you believe God for? You heard her at, in children's church quoting scripture and now she's on the street corner and everybody's saying she's done with and they've wrapped her up. What do you do, preacher, with that, with that ministry that you've got and you started off with thousands and now you're down to just your family? <laughs> the average church in America only lasts for two years because when it doesn't work, You wrap it up. I feel ministry. Because some of you have wrapped it up and you've put it away and it's in the tomb. And the first question God wants to ask you is show me where you laid him. Show me where he broke your heart. Show me where they said you'd never be anything. Take me back to the place in your childhood where he touched you where no man should ever touch you. Show me where he took your manhood. I, I, I know you're struggling with your sexual identity, but can we go back a little farther and you just tell me, where, where did they lay Lazarus? This strange thing happens in Mother Welch. I'm just about done here. This is my first close. The Bible says... That Mary and Martha and the, the mourners take Jesus to the tomb and they're weeping along the way. Because in this time, you would pay for mourners to come and cry and, and mourn the death of somebody that they didn't even know. And so they're mourning and everybody's walking down crying when resurrection is walking with them. And they get to the tomb. And when they get to the tomb, Jesus deals with the second thing. Because now we know where Lazarus is. But there's a problem because there's something in between Lazarus and Jesus. Are you with me? We're about to get out of here. Not only do you have to show Jesus where you lay Lazarus, but Jesus is going to say this next thing. That stone you put there? <laughs> Go ahead and roll it away. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Because if God wants to do it, he can do it. I mean, there's never a stone that he can't handle. 
But I've come to find out after 14 years of full-time ministry that there's some things that you're responsible for for your own deliverance. <laughs> I'm not going to get help right here because we got lazy saints who you use prayer as an excuse not to do anything for the Lord. But you want God to bless you financially and God saying, why don't you go ahead and tithe? I mean, roll away the stone. Look, look. I'm going to come down your road. Just hang out for a minute. You, you, you want God to bless you with a, a, with a good wife. And God's saying you don't even love the one you've got. Why don't you go ahead and roll away the stone? You're praying for a good man. And you got 15 of them that you're hanging out with every month. And God's saying roll. Oh, you want God to fix your marriage. But you still haven't deleted the old phone numbers. I see nervous, don't Jeff, you just amen me, nobody will know I'm in your business. You've got to understand that in your process of deliverance, there's some stuff that you've got to do. There's some stuff that he's not going to do for you. At some point, you got to get your act together. You sit, okay, I'm going to get in trouble here, but i got folks in my ministry who say, well, I'm addicted to pornography. Why do you have a laptop in your room? Come back, come back, come back, come back. I just felt the anointing leave. I just... Roll away the stone. Because I can't do anything until you roll it away. But Jesus, because our butts always get in the way. Maybe you don't understand this, but Lazarus has been dead. Not one, not two, not four. Not four. He's been dead. Can I break this down, Mother Welch? Is that all right? He's been dead for four days, and we're about to shout in just a moment. He's been dead for four days. Rigor mortis has begun to set in for four days, and, and uh, uh, his eyelid is starting to be eaten by bugs for four days. And, and they say to him, he stinketh. <laughs> He stinketh because you expect deliverance to smell good. I'm going to try the back row. Uh huh. See, I can tell when somebody's getting a real breakthrough because they come down to the altar and they ain't got that little cute wave that you do on Sunday morning when you got the right perfume and a new skirt on and you got your makeup did and your hair done and your nails did and you're feeling and looking good. But if you ever see somebody get some real breakthrough, they got eyelashes on the back of their ear, their make makeup has run down their cheek. If you ever see somebody get a real breakthrough, the ushers don't have enough cloth to put over them. They're rolling and shaking around. If you ever see somebody get real breakthrough, they don't care if I stink just bring me out they don't care if I smell just bring me out I don't care how long I've been here just come on and bring me out that's why some of y'all sat in your seat when pastor said come down because I want to believe God for healing because you're so busy worried about you stinking and what are people going to think about you but if you need a real breakthrough I dare you to just wave your hands and say God I stink but bring me out I don't smell good, but bring me out. I'm, I'm about to land this plane. Watch this. He's been in there for four days, and that number is important because the Pharisees believed that God could resurrect anybody. The Sadducees didn't believe that God was able to resurrect. But the Pharisees believed that he could resurrect anybody, but watch this, up to three days. But here it is, four days. And Jesus wants to go past your theology and make you believe that I'm bigger than what you grew up believing. I'm bigger than what the doctor said. I'm bigger than what other folks believed. I'm bigger with your last preacher told you that I'm bigger. Even though you've been dead four days, I'm still here and I can resurrect. The problem with the didactic question of time is what is time? What, what is time? I don't mean to confuse you so early in the morning, but what is time to a God who is eternal? Now, now I heard Pastor Britt said it, and, and I'm going to apologize later, but the old saints used to say it. They used to say he may not come when you want him, but he'll always be on time. The problem I've got with it is 
is it's not in the scripture for a reason. Watch this. Because uh, next month I'll head to Japan and I'll be preaching in Tokyo and then I'll go over to Singapore and preach and then I'll land in Indonesia and I'll finish my tour there preaching. And when I get over there, Evangelist Regina, the first three or four days are always the toughest for me because even though I'm in Tokyo, my body and the system that I've been living in is back in California, which is completely the opposite time. So... I'm about to run through them doors. So when I get to Tokyo, even while everybody else is sleeping, I'm wide awake. Because even though we're in Tokyo's time, my body is in the time back in California. Okay, y'all slow. Y'all don't even get it. We got this thing called jet lag. And it takes me a minute to get used to the new time zone because I'm so used to living in this time zone. So even if you place me somewhere else, my body cannot adjust quick enough to adjust to the time zone that we're in. What are you talking about preacher because Jesus did not start his life here on earth the Bible lets us know that he was divine first before he was human so divinity came down and wrapped itself in humanity and understand that where Jesus came from there was no sense of time time was created in Genesis chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 where God said let there be light and let there be the separation of night and day and the separation was between the light he created time for our existence so that we would know the end of a thing and the beginning of a thing the problem is that Jesus created time for you and I as humans he did not create time for himself because he walks in eternity so when he came I'm a shout right here so when he came down to earth I understand that he is never on time because he's never been in time He's eternity walking on time. Ah, okay, so let me break it down this way. So just like I told you that when I get to Japan, my body is in a different time zone. God told me to tell about five and a half folks in this room that the reason he's not concerned about your situation is because he's in a different time zone. Because in the eternity that he lives in, there is no sickness. There is no crying. There is no dying. There is no fear. That's why he comes down and sees Lazarus and he's not nervous because he's never seen a death in eternity. Hurry, watch this. I'm, 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 I'm landing right here. He's not worried about time because he is eternity. He will never be on time. He's always late. He was late for his own funeral. It's all right. Save it for later. You'll get it on the way home. Truth is. In your situation, he has never been on time. He has always been late. Jesus has this discussion with the disciples a couple of verses before, and he tells them, the reason I'm not coming is because God will be glorified in this. And God told me to encourage you that the reason you've been denied is so that he can be glorified. I've overspent my time. <laughs> Jesus looks into the tomb. <laughs> I'm about to lose it up here. He looks into the tomb and he cries out after the tears have gone. Because at some point you got to stop crying and you got to do something. At some point we got to believe this thing or not. And Jesus looks and he says, Lazarus! Come forward. Now the preacher told me that the reason he said Lazarus was because if he hadn't said anybody's name, everybody who won the grave would have come up. The problem I have with that is that Lazarus wasn't the only Lazarus who had died. So how is it that no other Lazarus had arisen? It wasn't until I read when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, that I looked up what the name Lazarus means. And the word Lazarus means the one whom God helps. Because you get to a point where Mother Welch can't help you. <laughs> where Martha has given up on you. Mary's thrown in the towel. So Lazarus, the God who can help you, says, come forth. And 
the back. You hear this thumping. <laughs> you hear whispering from folks. What's going on? He's so rude he would come late to the funeral. And he's got the met told us to turn away the stone. We're tired. We've been here for the last four days crying, and he wants us to do all this work. And now with his crazy self, is out here saying Lazarus. And then what's that noise? Who's making, would y'all stop all that noise? What is that? And Mary and Martha are still crying. Because Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Didn't I tell y'all, well, if y'all gonna sit somewhere with all that thumping and all that knocking, and all of a sudden you hear a gasp. <laughs> because hopping out in dead men's clothes is the one that was wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in death. Watch this, we're going home. And he hops himself out and everybody gasps. Because what is it? when nobody can help you get out. I want to talk to everybody who keeps making excuses. Nobody picked me up and brought me out. I went to that church and nobody prayed for me. They won't even speak to me half the time. I would have gone to the service, but I'm mad at so-and-so. See, real people who's been dead long enough, they don't need the music. They don't need Jordan on the drums. Real folks will praise God in the middle of an offering because he brought me out. All right, we're going home. Here's all I need you to do. I need you to find about two or three folks around you, make sure they're the right folks, and I need you to stand up and prophesy to them and just tell them I'm coming out. Come on, come on, come on. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. Uh-huh. Come out, come out. Uh-huh, I'm coming out. 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 I may have dead men's clothes on, but I'm coming out. I might stink, but I'm coming out. I might be broke, but I'm coming out. I might be crazy, but I'm coming out. I might be single, but I'm coming out. I might be married, but I'm coming out. I might not have a job, but I'm coming out. I might be young, but I'm coming out. I might be old, but I'm coming out. I may be fat, but I'm coming out. With my skinny self, I'm coming out. My health may not be the best, but I'm coming out. I might wear the same clothes every Sunday, but I'm still coming out. I might not have my wig on straight, but I'm coming out. I may not have the job I want to have, but I'm coming out. My kids may be strung out on the street, but I'm coming out. I may not have the ministry I want yet, but I'm coming out. My business might not be together, but I'm coming out. My ministry may not be all I want it to be, but I'm coming out. I I may not have the car I want, but I'm coming out. I may not have the house I want, but I'm coming out. I dare you to touch two more people and say, I'm coming out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm coming out. You ain't gotta like me, but I'm still coming out. You don't ever have to talk to me, but I'm still coming out. You don't have to smile my way, but I'm coming out. You can give me the offering if you want to, but I'm still coming out. You can sit there with your sedity self, but I'm still coming out. I dare somebody to shout, I'm coming out. I'm a single mother, but I'm still coming out. I'm a dad making it all by myself, but I'm still coming out. I've been broken hearted, but I'm still coming out. May not dress like you want me to, but I'm still coming out. May be 15 years old, but I'm still coming out. My health may not be what I want it to be, but I'm still coming out. <laughs>